thank you for watching on this 15th day of December 2021. Kenya records cases of the Omicron variant as the World Health Organization warns over the fast spreading sprain that is now presenting in most countries. In Hong Kong, hundreds get rescued after fire breaks out in Hong Kong high rise. Meanwhile, the people of Kentucky are working round the clock to rebuild their lives after tornadoes devastated the U.S. state. For this and more stories, you're watching Switch Focus. I'm Harriet Shimea and our sign language interpreter is Michael Maivia. Now to our top story. The World Health Organization has warned that the coronavirus variant Omicron is spreading at a rate not seen with previous strains and is likely to present in most countries. The Omicron variant has been detected in over 70 countries now since it was first identified three weeks ago by scientists in South Africa, which was the first to experience a surge in COVID-19 driven by the new variant. This, however, has fueled concerns that its large number of mutations will help it spread faster and evade protection provided by COVID-19 vaccines or prior infection. Meanwhile, in Kenya, three cases have been reported, one from South, Af South Africa and two are Kenyans. We will be bringing that report later tonight. Now we move on. We are more than 1,200 people have been rescued from one of Hong Kong's World Trade Center as dozens of firefighters managed to extinguish a fire that tripped through one of the city's busiest high-rise buildings and left more than a dozen injured. Police at the scene told reporters that everyone at the 39-story structure in Causeway Bay has been brought to safety after more than 300 were trapped earlier on the rooftop of the building, which houses both offices and a shopping center. At least 13 people are in hospital, with some suffering from smoke inhalation. The people of Kentucky are working to rebuild their lives after tornadoes devastated the U.S. state. One resident surrounded by rubble described the scene as the definition of hell on earth. In the town of Mayfield, one of the worst hit areas, volunteers are donating hot dogs and burgers to the community. Terry Dubai with more. The deadly tornadoes that ripped through Kentucky over the weekend destroyed around a thousand homes. One among them belonged to the Ramos family in the Mayfield. They tied themselves with ropes to a basement sewer pipe as tornado ripped their home apart just a few feet above them. God, she said, had wrapped his arms around them. We heard a loud noise. My husband said, it's coming, and we protected the children. We hid in a closet. We heard a noise and we ran out. I grabbed my baby. We were in the closet and we listened to many intense noises in the house. It's very terrible what happened. I thank God. Thanks to him, we were able to escape. He protected us from this awful thing. I am grateful to God because I did not lose any of my children or my husband. We lost our stuff. We lost everything. This is going to take a lot of money. We don't have enough money to fix all this. But by Sunday, standing near her bedroom wall collapsed by a telephone pole. A child's desk, perched in the open air and home canned beans, scattered among broken glass and debris on the floor. It was the future that was worrying the 54-year-old. Electricity, water and gas were still off for many residents in Mayfield. Some were making due at home while others left for motels in Paducah or elsewhere, friends, homes, state parks and temporary shelters. In a community centre in a nearby wingo called The Way, dozens of people had spread toiletries, blankets and teddy bears among a sea of coats. They ate food on folding tables. Terry Dubai, Switch TV. Thank you, Terry, for that report. Now, AIDS transfer poses a golden opportunity for the international community to interact with the Afghan interim government, a government that is looking forward to new chapters of relations with the international community, according to a spokesman of the Afghanistan's interim government, Damaris Nyambura Hasmo. 
The spokesman made the remarks in response to the World Bank confirming that donors have approved the transfer of 280 million US dollars to UNICEF and the World Food Program from the World Bank Administered Afghanistan Reconstruction Trust Fund. Since an Islamic government was formed in Afghanistan, it is independent, responsible, committed to its pledges, been applying a positive policy with a very constructive foreign policy. It is a golden opportunity for the international community, particularly the powerful countries of the world, to interact with today's Afghanistan and open a new chapter of relations that could benefit Afghanistan and the international community. But Afghanistan faces a still with or new problems. The international community will also be responsible for that. As we have seen till now, the international community's approach has not been far-seeing and has not been realistic. He further added that Afghanistan faces a severe economic and humanitarian crisis in the verge of the winter months. A World Bank statement stated that the money will be used to boost food security and health programs in the country. Afghan experts welcome the aid but insist that it is not enough to help millions of people in need. They urge the international community to unfreeze Afghanistan central bank's reserves of $9.5 billion now in the hands of the United States. As the world tries to punish the government of the people of Afghanistan, in fact, they are not punishing the government. Those who are being punished are the people of Afghanistan. Soon after the Taliban took over power on August 15, the United States blocked access to $9.5 billion in Afghanistan central bank reserves held in the U.S. The International Monetary Fund posed the release of more than $400 million in funds, citing a lack of clarity within the international community regarding recognition of a government in Afghanistan. The World Bank also stopped dispersing aid money reserved for the country. Many experts believe that this winter will be the harshest of all times for millions of Afghans. Reporting for Switch TV, my name is Damris Nyambura. Opponents of Tunisian President Kais Said slammed his decision to extend a month's long suspension of parliament, accusing him of dealing another blow to the country's nascent democracy. Saeed had on Monday evening vowed to press on with reforms to Tunisia's political system after he sacked the government, froze the legislature and seized wide-ranging executive powers in July. The former constitutional law professor announced an 11-week popular consultation to produce a draft constitutional and other reforms ahead of a referendum on July 25th next year. The party of Gambian opposition leader Oceana Dabo announced that it appealed to the Supreme Court to annul the proclaimed re-election of the incumbent Adama Barrow in the presidential election, accusing him of multiple irregularities, including vote buying. Adama Barrow was declared the winner by the Electoral Commission of the presidential election of December 4th, with about 53% of the vote against about 27% for the main of his five competitors. Osina Dabo, the presidential election, is one round contest in the Gambia. Moving on, French officers handed over the keys to a military base in the Malian city of Timbuktu on Tuesday. After a nearly nine-year deployment, the ceremony took place near the city's airport with Malian army officers, officials from the local government and the United Nations attending. Terry Dubai with more. The ceremony took place near the city's airport with Malian army officers, officials from the local government and the United Nations attending. The French flag was lowered and the Malian flag raised in its place on the base, where a force of about 150 soldiers have remained after Paris began withdrawing troops having liberated the city from Islamists in 2013. The highly symbolic departure comes after French forces already left the bases in the northern towns of Kidal and Tessalit this year. Even though the jihadist-driven violence in the Sahel state shows no signs of easing, 
But after leaving the Kidal and Tessal bases in North Mali, French troops are now packing up in Timbuktu, the last of three bases in the far north of the country. All the material is being sent south by road to the French base in Gao. A few days prior, French legionaries and Malian troops had liberated the northern desert city after eight-month Islamist occupation. But now, French troops are leaving their base in Timbuktu, raising questions about the future of jihadist activity as militants are put down roots in the countryside. Terry Dubai, Switch TV. Now on matters COVID-19, South Africa's health minister on Tuesday received his coronavirus booster vaccine and urged South Africans to come forward for their jobs. Speaking to reporters in Pretoria, Joe Falafa urged citizens to ignore those anti-vax protesters and focus on the facts ahead of us. Brian Sambu with more. Fahla received his Johnson & Johnson booster shot at the Zuid Africans Hospital along with the first group of health workers who took part in a vaccination trial between February and May, urging South Africans to ignore those anti-vax protesters and focus instead on the facts. How long that is going to take, nobody knows. We might need, so if possible, go into 2022, there must be another booster, but hopefully... By the time we reach 2023, my own speculation as I start, try to understand this, it might be that by the time we reach 2023, it must be dead. The virus must be, might be gone. It might have finished even its power of new. The minister also wished South African President Cyril Ramaphosa a speedy recovery after he contracted COVID-19 earlier this week. Fine. Uh, we wish him a very speedy recovery, Mr. President. We can't wait for you to come back and give us uh, all the directions, but we know that uh, you are okay where you are and you'll be back with us within a few days. After a period of low transmission of about 200 new cases per day in early November, South Africa COVID-19 cases began rising dramatically. On November 25th, scientists in the South African nation confirmed the Omicron variant, which has more than 50 mutations. Meanwhile, a Russian emergency ministry plane arrived in South Africa with humanitarian aid on Tuesday amid the spread of the new Omicron coronavirus strain. Besides the delivery of the humanitarian aid, Russian sanitary medics will be conducting research on the Omicron strain in South Africa. The travel of Russian specialists comes after Russian President Vladimir Putin's order, which followed a request from the South African President Cyril Ramaphosa, according to the Russian Emergency Ministry. Brian Sambo Switch TV. Boris Johnson has won backing for COVID passes in England, despite the biggest revolt by Tory MPs since he became Prime Minister. A total of 99 conservatives voted against the government, but the measure was passed by a majority of 243, thanks to Labour support. British MP Rossi Winterton announced votes on the introduction of COVID-19 passes in England, a requirement for frontline health and social care workers to be vaccinated and a mask mandate expansion, respectively. Listen in. The eyes to the right, 369, the nose to the left, 126. So the eyes have it, the eyes have it. Unlock. Eyes to the right, 385. The nose to the left, 100. So the eyes have it, the eyes have it. Unlock. Eyes to the right, 441. The nose to the left, 41. So the eyes have it, the eyes have it. We now take a short break, but we'll be right back with more. Stay tuned.
Welcome back to Switch Focus. My name is Harriet Chimea and our signed language interpreter is Michael Maivia. Now we move on where Malta has become the first EU country to legalize the cultivation and personal use of cannabis. Adults will be allowed to carry up to 7 grams of cannabis and grow no more than 4 plants at home. But smoking it in public or in front of children will be illegal. Several other nations have similar plans such as Germany, Luxembourg and Switzerland countries like the Netherlands tolerate cannabis use in certain circumstances. Malta's parliament voted in favour of the reform on Tuesday afternoon with the bill winning 36 votes in favour and 27 against it. To push forward the legislation which will do a number of good things. First of all, it will stop once and for all the criminalization of people who for a lot of time have been criminalized when they are not criminals. So we have put an end to the criminalization of people who are not criminals. Secondly, we are going to give uh, to curb uh, drug trafficking, cannabis trafficking, by making sure that people who make use of cannabis now have a safe and regularized way from where they can obtain cannabis. On Matter Sports, American gymnast Simone Biles has been named Athlete of the Year by Time magazine. Biles is the most decorated gymnast in the world and a four-time Olympic gold medalist. The athlete was praised for putting her mental health first after pulling out from the final at four events during the Tokyo Olympics. A month after the Tokyo Olympics, Biles testified before the U.S. Senate hearing into former USA gymnastics team Dr. Larry Nassar's sexual abuse scandal. Biles, along with hundreds of athletes, accused the FBI, USA Gymnastics and the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee of failing to stop the abuse. Now, one of the most influential genres of African music and dance, Congolese rumba is now on the UNESCO's intangible heritage list. This is aimed to helping to preserve the heritage that is often threatened, as Apollo James narrates. Some 60 applications were submitted by countries awaiting a decision which was finally made on Tuesday, December 14th. As UNESCO defines it, Intangible cultural heritage or living heritage is a legacy from our ancestors that we pass on to our descendants. It includes oral traditions, performing arts, social practices, rituals, and festive events. To be defined as intangible cultural heritage, a cultural practice must be dynamic. It must have meaning in people's lives. Attaining this status is the end of campaigning by two countries the Democratic Republic of Congo and neighboring Congo Brazzaville. They both occupy what was once the ancient kingdom of Congo, where the sinner's dance originated according to the two nations' joint application. Congolese rumba joins other living traditions such as Jamaican reggae music and Singaporean hawker food of UNESCO intangible cultural heritage of humanity. Despite its African origins, another school of thought also have it that rumba has become more closely associated with Latin dance. Among the earliest heroes of Congolese rumba were Wendo Kolosoi, Paul Nkamba, Franco, and Tipo K. Jazz, Tabule Rocheru, and Dr. Nico. Apollo James, Switch Television. Thank you, Apollo James, for that report. Now, Pierre-Emerick has been stripped of the Arsenal captain position and will not be considered for selection for the club's Premier League match against West Ham tonight following last week's disciplinary breach. Pierre, the club's highest paid player, was dropped from Arsenal's squad against Southampton on Saturday after returning late from a trip abroad. 
Mikel Arteta left the striker out of his 20-month squad and confirmed this disciplinary breach during Saturday's pre-match interview. To make the decision that we made is because um, it was really hurting. And uh, it's still like this, and uh, it needs a little bit of time to heal. So for now, again, um, it's not involved in the squad. Still on matter sports, the FIFA Arab Cup is heading to the decisive stage. This Wednesday, Qatar hosts the semi-finals of the tournament. Three African teams remain in the competition. Tunisia and Egypt face each other while Algeria comes head-to-head -head with the hosts Qatar. For Algeria's manager, team spirit is essential to win. Finals of the tournament. Three African teams remain in the competition. Tunisia and Egypt face each other while Algeria comes head to head with hosts Qatar. It is always better to know the players of the opponent team. Knowing some of our players play here in Qatar, but the Qatar team also knows some of our players. In the semi-final, you are one step away from the final. And the spirit of the team is what will determine the qualifier, as happened in the Morocco match, regardless of the tactical aspect. We wanted to win more than them, to surpass ourselves. The Desert Foxes team includes the attacking trio Belaili, Brahimi, Buneja. The final takes place this Saturday. After the FIFA Arab Cup, Qatar will host the World Cup in 2022. Now, in the light of Christmas spirit, from the giant Rockefeller tree to Saks Fifth Avenue light display, New York City Christmas lights usher in the holiday season, much the delight of the newly returned international tourists. Take a look. It's Christmas holidays indeed. Now, the fifth edition of Accra Fashion Week brought gathered West African designers for a weekend of runway shows after last year's break from the COVID-19 pandemic. Since its inception, the Accra Fashion Week has been a meeting point for designers all over Africa, not only to show their new creations, but to also create business opportunities, as Apollo James narrates. As the runways get busy, the newest local and West African trends are being shown, and with the huge platform of the internet, most of these designers know their designs may be shown anywhere in the world. We are Africans, so Ghanaian fashion is basically African. But what I do is I mix European with African. So you can wear it anywhere, anytime, and you can fit into any um, occasion and any society. Some of these designers have also started operations outside the borders of Ghana, and some others have also started exporting abroad to appeal bigger audiences. And some of my clients in the US, some of them have the African stores, which I provide, like what I'm wearing now, and some already made, we call it autogele, they are already made. So I sell to them in bulk. So you can see it's not only in Ghana that they are embracing the Ashoke. Outside too, like U.S., they are embracing it. Vajil Ablo, a prominent U.S. fashion designer of Ghanaian origin, who was artistic director of Louis Vuitton menswear, died late November, and some see him as the role model to follow in the fashion industry. Role with Louis Vuitton was a job. His role with Off-White was entrepreneurship. And it shows you that, you know, a lot of people here are stuck with, oh, I'm African, 
they wouldn't embrace me out there. Oh, I'm black, they're racist. He's showing you that it's not like that. Everyone has their culture, everyone has their lifestyle. And if you understand marketing and you work that way, you can do it. Accra Fashion Week is a four-day event in which key players of the industry in West Africa gather together to discuss the business of fashion and to showcase their designs. Apollo James, Switch Television. Thank you, Apollo, for that report. Now, China's hair transplant market is serving more and more clients, especially young people who want to stop hair fall early. Employees at one of its Beijing clinics said they serve more than 400 visitors each day on weekends. Thinking of a hair transplant? Here is Shilang Yetich with a report. A hair transplant is a procedure in which hairs from the back or side of a person's head are retransplanted to a bald area on the front or top of the person's head. About 6,800 new hair transplant companies have opened every year for the past three, according to Chinese data technology service firm Tianyancha. One of the pioneers in the industry is Yonge Medical Group, which runs a chain of Yonge hair transplant clinics across the country. I am 24 years old. As I was under a lot of pressure at work one year ago, I started losing hair from my temples. At a public hospital in Beijing, doctors say young people make up a large proportion of their hair loss patients. The majority of air loss patients are young people. Irregular sleeping patterns and eye pressure can cause them to have scalp inflammation and for their air to become unhealthy. According to industry experts, patients spend an average of about 27,000 yuan, about 4,200 US dollars per person on hair transplant surgery. Despite the high cost, consumers show a growing demand for the service, driving up business for hair transplant companies entering the market. We establish six to eight new clinics each year. Compared with last year, we have 50% more customers this year. The market size of China's hair transplant sector is expected to grow at a compound annual growth rate of 23% from 2020 to 2025. Shilang Etich, Switch TV. Well, that story brings us to the end of our bulletin. My sin anchor has been Michael Maivia, my director Victor, my producer Paula James, and I, Harriet Chimea. Enjoy the rest of your viewership. <laughs>